So our culture has a lot of different ideas about what it means to be great and what it means to do great things. For some people, it's about, you know, it's about beauty. It's about being the most beautiful. For some, it's about being the most fit. For some, it's, it's about being the smartest or the brightest. Uh, for some people, it's all about success and, and they define success a lot of different ways. Uh, it's about being at the top of the class. It's about, you know, having the promotion. It's about having the most sales. Uh, for some people, when they think about greatness, you know, they think about the thing they have, you know, the house, you know, the adult toys that they get to play with, the things that they can afford to do. And, and they look at all of that and, and it seems like that's greatness. And, and there's just so many different ideas in our culture about what greatness is and what greatness looks like. But for Jesus followers, uh, there's not a subjective definition for greatness. There's actually an objective definition for greatness that Jesus gave to his followers in the first century that was written down for us and, and preserved for us. So for every Jesus follower, Follower in every definition, in every generation, we don't get to make up our own definition uh, for greatness. Jesus has defined what greatness is, and he defined what it looks like to choose greatness and, and what it means to actually do something great with your life. Jesus defined greatness in the clearest of terms, and then he invited us to it. And so when his disciples were, you know, having a conversation about, you know, what greatness is and what greatness meant, and, and they all wanted to be great, uh, Jesus, he set them straight. He set the record straight. And this is how he defined greatness to his followers. He said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. So greatness begins and ends with the decision to serve. He says, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. So according to Jesus, greatness is renouncing self-centric thinking and self-centric living and adopting an others-centric way of life that ultimately leads us to serve other people. That, that's according to Jesus. And if you follow Jesus as Savior and King, then you have to go with Jesus' definition. Jesus said that greatness is renouncing self-centric thinking, it's self-centric living, and it's adopting others-centric style of living that causes you to ultimately serve other people. That's what Jesus says. That's what greatness is. That's what greatness looks like. That's what it means to choose greatness. Uh, according to Jesus, he said, if you wanna win, if you wanna win in life, if you wanna win as a mom or as a dad or a husband, as a wife or as an employer, as an employee, as a citizen, you know, a part of your community, if you wanna win, then winning is putting everybody else first and putting yourself at the back of the line. It doesn't feel like winning. It's not always easy to do. It doesn't look a lot like winning always. But Jesus said, if you really wanna know what it means to win, if you really wanna know what it means to be great and to choose greatness and to do the great thing, it's about deciding to put everybody else first and putting yourself last. It's about getting yourself out of the middle of your circle. So no longer will you be self-centric in your thinking or your living. You decide to put everybody else in the center of your circle, in the center of your world. Jesus said, that's greatness. When you decide the best place for me is at the back of the line and the best place for everybody else is the front of the line. Jesus said that greatness is learning to walk into every room that you walk into and every relationship that you're a part of saying, what can I do to help you? What can I do to serve you? Rather than going through life with this unstated question driving your whole life of what can you do for me? Because Jesus would say the better way, the greatest way to live is not saying, hey, what can all of you do for me? And, and what can the world do for me? Uh, what can my family do for me? What can my friends do for me? Jesus would say the choosing greatness is deciding to say, well, what can I do for you? How can I help you? How can I carry some of your weight? What can I do to help? And so Jesus, he, he taught this and then he demonstrated it. And we talked about this last week. Jesus in the upper room, uh, he celebrated Passover with his disciples and then it says that he took a towel. And he took a towel and he washed the feet of his disciples. He became the least important person in the room. He decided to go to the back of the line and put everybody else first. He decided to be others centered and it drove him to serve his disciples. And in that moment, the master in the room picked up a towel and washed the feet of the servants in the room. The teacher in the room decided that he would take a towel and wash the students' feet that were in the room. And Jesus demonstrated 
what greatness is and what it means to choose greatness. He took a towel and he washed the feet of his disciples, even the ones who would betray him and even the ones who would deny him and even the ones who would doubt him. And all of them certainly at some point in time would disappoint him. But he decided that they should go to the front of the line even though they didn't deserve to be in the front of the line. They hadn't earned a place at the front of the line, but it wasn't about earning a place at the front of the line. It was about an act of grace that says, you are more important than than me and what can I do to help you? What can I do to serve you? And so Jesus washed their feet. And, And I think this was Jesus's way of saying, hey, if you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna be a disciple, you can't throw in your towel. You can't forfeit your towel. You can't leave your towel behind. You you can't neglect your towel. You you can't throw in your towel to busyness. You can't get so busy that that you don't have time to think about other people. You can't be so busy that you don't have time to serve other people or to ask the question, what can I do to help? You can't throw in your towel to apathy where where you get so cold hearted and maybe so cynical or skeptical that you you just keep your distance from everything and everybody because you're you're just, you know, nobody nobody deserves it. Nobody lives up, everybody disappoints. And and so you kind of just throw in your towel to apathy. Jesus said, you can't do that. You, you shouldn't throw your towel into misplaced priorities because you probably, you're doing very important things. But these very important things have become the most important thing. And the tragedy is these very important things are not the most important thing, but it's causing you to neglect the most important thing, which is other people. You don't even have time to go to the back of the line because all of these priorities won't let you. And, and don't throw in your towel to selfish pursuits. You know, don't make your life all about you. Uh, don't let everything become a means to an end, which is your end. Don't make it all about you, what you do, what you don't do, where you go, where you don't go. Don't throw in your towel to selfish pursuits because at the end of the day, it's real easy for all of us to say, hey, I wanna be at the front of the line. I wanna jockey for a position at the front of the line. I don't wanna be at the back of the line. I wanna be in the middle of my circle. And it's so easy just to live life that way and not even know that we are living that way. Uh, Jesus would say, if you decide to throw in the towel, you are missing your opportunity for greatness. If you throw in your towel, you're missing your opportunity for greatness because the towel, it it, it almost like it represents a willingness to serve. It's like a willingness to say, I will go to the back of the line. That's who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus. I will go to the back of the line. You can have my my place at the front of the line. You are more important than me. So what can I do to help you. So the towel is like a reminder that I'm supposed to be willing to serve. And the towel is really the means to greatness, according to Jesus. Uh, not a literal towel, but just the idea that I, I'm here to serve. I'm wired to serve. I'm created to serve. So when you put together everything that Jesus taught, uh, this is what Jesus is saying, that greatness is choosing to serve the people around you. Greatness is choosing to serve the people around you. Now, that, that's kind of speaking outward and I feel like it's a more powerful sentence to actually say it in a more personal way that greatness is choosing to serve the people around me. Greatness is choosing to serve the people around me. And so I, I want us to say that out loud together. All right, here in London, Williamsburg, Somerset. You ready? Let's go. Greatness is choosing to serve the people around me. Th- that's greatness. Whenever you choose to serve someone around you, And whenever I choose to serve one around me, I am choosing greatness. I am doing the great thing. I am becoming the greatest version of myself when I am serving other people. When you're serving other people, when you put other people first, when you put others in the middle of the circle, you are becoming the greatest version of yourself. And by choosing greatness, by choosing to serve, you are holding back, you're defending yourself, you're, you're staving off all the things that are gonna turn you into the worst version of yourself. Things like arrogance and pride and self-centeredness. Uh, those are the things that make us small and insignificant. Prideful people, arrogant people, self-centered people, they end up being small and they end up being insignificant. Nobody can fit into their circle because they only have room for themselves. Nobody else is really worried about because the only person they really truly worry about is themselves. And so, you know, Jesus says, every time you choose to serve, you're you're holding off arrogance and pride and self-centeredness, which is so easy. It's so easy to live that way. It's easy for me, it's easy for you. But it's only gonna make you into a small, insignificant version of yourself. When, When you choose Greatness, you're holding off those things, which is gonna make you a version of yourself that you don't even like. It's gonna turn you into that version of yourself where you're just so easily offended. 
All right? Have you ever met a person who's just so easily offended? You know, their feelings are always on their shirts. Like they're always offended. They're always hurt. They're always pooched mouth. <sighs> what did you do? Oh my goodness. You know, what did they not say? What did they say? How they said it? They didn't come. They did come. They did smile. They didn't notice me. And, and it's just like, oh my goodness. And let me ask you a question and, and, and show of hands, just so I know I'm, I'm not the only one who, who knows people like this. How many would say, I know a person who's easily offended? Don't raise your hand if you rode with them to church, but, but just... <laughs> Just, just, okay. All right. Some of us do. Some of you were still very afraid because it was like, is this a trick question? So I understand you weren't willing to spend a very uncomfortable afternoon with the person you wrote to church with. So we do, we know that person, but you know why people are easily offended? It is not a personality thing. It's not a disposition. It's not a temperament thing. It happens every single time we place ourselves in the middle of the circle. It happens every single time we place ourselves at the front of the line and we assume in those moments that everything is all about us. Everything is all about me. Everybody should be catering to me. Everybody should be paying attention to me. Everybody should do it exactly the way that I want it done. And when it's not, then I get offended, I get upset, I get hurt, I get angry. Because that's the way we see the world when we are in the middle of our circle, when we are first rather than last. And so we just become that, that person. Uh, we become easily offended uh, because we think everything's about us. And then when we choose to serve, it frees us from, you know, better than type thinking, that I'm better than you because, you know, I don't and you do. I'm, I'm better than you because I'm smarter than you. I'm, I'm better than you because of my story. I, I'm better than you because of my life. I'm better than you because of my accomplishments. It, it frees us from that. Because you have to forsake better than thinking to go to the back of the line. You have to forsake better than thinking in order to put somebody else at the center of the circle while you take yourself out of it. It just requires it. So every time you say yes to serving, every time you choose serving, you're choosing the greatest version of yourself and you're keeping yourself from hurting other people and you're keeping yourself from hurting yourself in pursuit of serving yourself because it's a really ironic thing. You put yourself in the center of the circle because the person you're most concerned about is you, but in serving yourself, yourself, you end up hurting yourself. I end up hurting myself. And so the towel, the towel is, is this reminder that I'm supposed to turn my attention away from me and I'm supposed to be paying attention to you. What can I do to help you? What can I do to carry your burden? What can I help you to win your struggle? What can I do? What can I do to help you? What, what, is, what can I do that is best for you? What can I do? Because the towel reminds me of that. It's greatness. And Jesus said that greatness is choosing to serve the people around me, but it's bigger than that. It's better than that. The New Testament says, when we read through it, we, we get the idea that greatness is also choosing to serve the people who are coming behind you, who are coming behind me. Greatness is just not choosing to serve the people around me, but greatness is actually choosing to serve the people who are coming behind me, behind you, behind us. And, and there's so many scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, about the importance of investing in, in the next generation, uh, of investing in the faith of the next generation or the future of faith itself. And you may not know this, but the scripture, the scripture gives the responsibility um, for the next generation's faith to the present generation of faith. We should all just think about that for a moment, that God, God places the responsibility for the next generation of faith upon this present generation of faith. God says that this present generation of faith is to take responsibility, to feel personally responsible for the faith of the next generation because the idea is that our life is bigger than our lifetime. Your life is bigger than your lifetime. You cannot exist before the day you were born. You cannot influence backwards. You cannot echo with your life in a backward direction, but you can echo your influence into the future beyond the day of your death. When that day of your death goes on your tombstone, when it's printed in your obituary, that you can actually extend your influence. I can extend my influence beyond the day that I die because our life is bigger than our lifetime. And the scripture says when we get this right, when it comes to the next generation, and specifically when it comes to the faith of the next generation, the future of faith, that our influence can actually linger and echo into the third and even into the fourth generation. That means that when we influence the next generation of children, we influence their children, and we have the capacity to influence their children's children. 
Now, I want you to just think about that for a moment. Think about that as a mom. Think about it as a dad. Think about that as a grandparent. You know, we got an 11-year-old, nine-year-old in our house. And, and it's just not about influencing Shepherd. And it's just not about influencing Grayson. It's just not about influencing your son or daughter. As you influence your son and daughter, the echo of your influence is going to reverberate beyond your son or daughter to your grandson or granddaughter, to your great-grandson and great-granddaughter, and perhaps even beyond that. And so this is a really important thing. And this is the thing that's so easy to lose sight of in the mundanity, in the, you know, the mundaneness of life and just kind of the common things that we do day in, day out, over and over and over again. We just forget this. We, we forget how important this is. And so the scripture says that we as Christians are to walk by faith in such a way that we shape the faith of the future generation. And so God cared about this. God's cared about this, uh, like I said, all the way through the Old Testament into the New. And so God established two custodians or two guardians of, of the future of faith. And, and it's simply the family and the church that God says when it comes to preserving the faith of the next generation, when it comes to investing in the next generation, it's all about the family, it's all about the church because God's plan is that parents, God's plan is that parents would take personal responsibility for the faith of their children and grandchildren. That, that God wants gr mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers to take personal responsibility for the faith of their children and grandchildren. Now that's a big deal. Now we take responsibility for providing shoes for our kids and you know clothes for our kids and try to get a good education for our kids and we want our kids to experience things and see things and we try to give them all kinds of opportunities and we try to open all kinds of doors for our sons and daughters. But at the end of the day, God over and over again makes it real clear that our greatest responsibility as moms and dads is to pass faith on to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, that we are to take personal responsibility. We are to feel that responsibility, feel that burden. But we're not alone because we also have the church. And it's not one or the other, the family or the church. It's supposed to be the church working with the family and the family working with the church. And so families come together as part of a local church, like our local church, the Creek Church. And when the family understands that they are to take personal responsibility for the faith of the next generation, and the church comes alongside of mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, you know, in order to further the future of faith in the next generation, then this thing begins to work the way that God wants it to work. And the way that God wants us to understand this is that every parent and every person in the local church, every person who's a parent or grandparent or every person who's involved in the local church, we all should be interested in and invested in the next generation. We should all be interested in and invested in the future of faith, whether it's your children, my children, or somebody else's children. You are taking responsibility for your family, but you're also part of the local church. And that means that we're taking responsibility for each other's families. And, and this is an important thing, and this is why God talks so much about it. And, and, and on top of that, the, the status of things in, in America, uh, according to the latest numbers, the church in America, it's growing smaller and it's growing older. It's growing smaller and it's growing older. And the younger a generation is in America, uh, the faster uh, faith is in decline in that generation. So that just simply means we have work to do. And that means that maybe, you know, generations of Jesus followers in the West, we've not taken this uh, very seriously. Uh, that there are families who've not taken this very seriously because faith has not been passed on uh, in many families to the next generation. And a lot of churches have not taken this seriously because there's not been faith passed on to a lot of people in the next generation. But when the family and the church can work together on this, it, it, it almost assures that faith will be passed on to the next generation. There, there's a guy in the New Testament who did this well. And lucky for us, uh, he wrote about it. And, and not only did he write about it, but he demonstrated it and other people wrote about it. And, and it was the Apostle Paul. And maybe nobody did more for the future of faith and the next generation than, than the Apostle Paul. Because he learned this as part of his Jewish faith. It was Moses that looked at the nation of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy and told them, said, hey, teach your children these things. Teach them in your home. Teach them to love the Lord thy God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and teach them all of these things that you're doing and why they're important. And one day when your son or daughter comes up to you and says, Dad, Mom, why is this stuff important? What's the meaning of all of this? Because they will perceive that it means something to you. 
And because it means something to you, it will begin to mean something to them. But don't ever imagine that if your faith doesn't mean something to you, that it's gonna mean something to your children. Your children will mirror the meaning that faith seems to have in your and my life. That they will pick up on what really matters and what doesn't matter. Not by the words that we say, but by the actions and the decisions that we make. And so he says, when they come up to you and they says, what does this mean? You'll be able to tell them because it does mean something to you and it'll begin to mean something for them and you'll begin to pass faith off to your children and grandchildren and the community of faith will rally beside those families and will pass it to the next generation of the entire community. Paul is kind of known for this because of his interaction with a teenager. And the whole story is recorded in Acts 16, and this is, this is how Luke records it. He said, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. So this is Paul's second missionary journey. He'd already made one trip around the Mediterranean rim and he would go tell the story of Jesus, tell the story of how Jesus changed his life, how Jesus died for sins, was raised from the dead. And and he started all these churches and he would go to the next place and the next place and the next place. Well, after he circled, you know, the territory that he wanted to cover, he waited and then he went back again to check on all the churches that he started and all the believers that had come to faith in Christ. So three years earlier on his first missionary journey, he had been right through this area, Derby, Lystra, and there was a 13 year old boy by the name of Timothy who came to faith in Christ. And so Timothy at 13 came to faith. Paul leaves and goes to the next place. Three years later, Paul is circling back around. And when he gets to this particular area that he's been to before, Luke says, the believers at Lystra and Iconium, they spoke well of Timothy. Uh, The older people in the church, the adults in the church, the the people who were a part of that that church there, they, they came up to Paul and they said, Paul, listen, there's something about this young man we know. He's 16 now and there's something that, that stands out about him. There's something about the, this kid. He's got a promising future. There's something special about this kid. We've been watching him. He came to faith three years ago. He's 16. There's just something special about him. He's gonna do something great one day. And, and, and so they spoke well of Timothy and we should all just stop and say, well, why did they say that? Or maybe better question would be, how could they say such a thing? Well, we know that Timothy had become an impressive young man and that his community of faith had recognized it. But partly uh, the reason why he was so you know, impressive and, and the reason that his faith had developed to the point that it was because he had a, a family of faith and he had his church. And those two things had come together to really invest in the future of faith, which was Timothy. Uh, we know that his family had some Christians because Paul will write about this later on when he said in, in, in 1 Timothy, he says, I am reminded, or 2 Timothy rather, I am reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy, which first lived. Before you had faith, there was faith in your grandmother Lois. And before you had faith, Timothy, there was faith in your mother Eunice. It was their faith before it became your faith. And because it meant something to them, they were able to pass it on to you. And because you were a part of your local church there, you were getting taught the scriptures at home, you were being taught scriptures by your church, they were discipling you. And the personal faith of your grandmother, the personal faith of your mother, the personal faith of all of those people that are in your church, it became generational faith in you. The baton was passed on and you are part of the future of faith, the next generation of faith. And so people, they would look at, they would look at Timothy and they were like, man, there's potential in this kid. And they would tell Paul, you gotta meet somebody. You gotta meet this 16 year old kid. I mean, he's just, he's just amazing. And so Paul met him and, and this is what Luke says. He says, after Paul met him, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. Now, for those of you who are type A, task driven, you gotta get it done. It's gotta be done right. And there's very, very, very little patience for things that get half done or things that are undone. And it's just gotta, we gotta get this done. This is important. This matters. This is the way to do it. You do it right. You do it right the first time. And then you go do what you're supposed to do after that. If you can kind of understand that type of living, then you can understand the apostle Paul. He's type A, he's driven, he's ambitious. He's got things to do, things to accomplish. He's trying to take the church and the gospel to the world. So he's got, he's got kind of a big to-do list. 
So he, he's got some things that, that are in his heart and there's some things that he's, he's wanting to accomplish. But it says that he wanted to take him along on the journey. He meets Timothy and after they talk, he looks at Timothy and says, Timothy, I'm, I'm moving on. I've got other places to go. You wanna go? You wanna be a part? Now, was this convenient for Paul to do? No. Would it slow Paul down? Probably. Would it affect Paul's you know, efficiency and productivity? Probably. Would Paul not do it the same because he had a 16 year old there with him? Perhaps. Would, would Paul feel a little bit encumbered, a little bit weighted down, a little bit you know, more responsibility, a little bit more looking over his shoulder? Yeah. Could Paul have said, I'm too busy? Could Paul, you know, got spiritual and said, this is too important. You know, that's how we speak when we get spiritual. This is too important. This is too important. The kingdom of God is important and I can't risk it. You know, I'm taking a 16. Could he have said that? Yeah, did he? No. Could he have looked at a 16 year old and said, you know, we have nothing in common. What am I gonna, what, what, what are we gonna talk about? He's gonna try to teach me new words. I'm not gonna be interested in new words. He's gonna be playing top 50 on his Spotify and I'm not gonna understand a single word. It's like, what do, I, what do I even have to talk to this kid about? I am like Paul. Like, I, I'm kind of the guy. What am I gonna do with, with this guy? But when Paul looked at Timothy, he saw the future. When Paul looked at Timothy, he, he saw that the future of faith mattered. And listen, when we look at the next generation, whether it's our children or somebody else's children or the children that runs around in our churches that are in our kids' department, that's in our student department, when we look at the next generation, it matters what we see. It matters what we see when we look at the next generation. Paul decided after looking at Timothy, I'm gonna give him time. I'm gonna give him access. I'm gonna give him opportunity. I'm, I'm gonna give him the margin and I'm gonna extend to him the patience to learn to do the important work, to ask important questions, to observe and learn, observe and learn. And I'm gonna give him a place on the team. I'm not making him the water boy, I'm giving him a place on the team. I'm giving him a seat at the table. Did he deserve it? No. Did he have the experience that required it? No. But Paul says, I'm gonna give him a, I'm gonna give him a seat at the table. I'm, I'm gonna give him a place on the team. Because Paul just didn't see a teenager he just didn't see an experience. He just didn't see a potential burden. He just didn't see somebody who had probably the propensity to drop the ball. Somebody whose frontal lobe was not even fully developed. So this guy didn't even have a full working brain yet. But it's like, yeah, I'm gonna take him along and I'm gonna trust him. I'm gonna make him part of the team and he's gonna fall down. I'm gonna help him back up and we're gonna learn together and it's probably gonna be testing at times, but we're gonna do it anyway. Because Paul saw the future of faith and he knew how important the next generation was. So it really could cause us to ask the question, who are you bringing along with you? Who are you bringing along with you? Not, not in just life. I'm talking about the things that really matter, like faith. Who are you bringing along with you? Are, are you dads, are you bringing your sons and daughters along? Moms, are you bringing your children along? Are, are you involved in your church to the point where you're helping to bring somebody else along with you? Who are you bringing along with you? Greatness is bringing somebody along with you. Insignificant, small people who don't wanna go to the back of the line, who don't wanna put others first and center, just go along. And they don't really think about bringing anybody along with them. And, and so Paul, he brought him along and says, not only did he want to bring him along, so he circumcised him. That's, that's quite the price for a jersey on the team. So he circumcised him uh, because of the Jews who lived in that area for, you know, all of them knew that his father was a Greek. So, you know, talk about an ordination service. It's like, you know, we're going to lay hands on you, Timothy. But before that, there's a surgery. And uh, you say, well, why would he do that? Because... Paul's center message was we've been set free from the law. We've been set free from all of that Old Testament legalism. And, but Paul wanted Timothy to have the best opportunity to succeed. And that's really what we want, right? For the future of faith, the next generation, we want them to have the absolute best opportunity to succeed. And, and Paul knew that other people knew that Timothy's dad was a Greek. He was an uncircumcised unbeliever. 
And, and if, if Timothy was gonna have a platform of influence, if he was gonna be able to speak in the lives of Jewish people, he, he probably should get circumcised. Did he have to get circumcised? No. But it was a lesson, it was an important lesson about you know, freedom. That just because it's free for you to do, it doesn't mean that it's really always the best thing for you to do. And sometimes it may be best to lay aside a freedom altogether for the sake and for the good of somebody else. And so, you know, this was kind of like maybe Paul's way of saying, hey, you know, Timothy, you know, if you wanna be on the team, you're gonna have to have some skin in the game. I mean, no pun intended, guy, but I mean, I'm just telling you, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have to be involved. I mean, we gotta see how serious you are about this. And he was teaching him, like, life's not gonna be easy. I mean, this is lessons, hard lessons right out of the gate. He didn't coddle him, he didn't pamper him. He said, this is gonna be tough. And doing things worthwhile in life, it's not always easy. So they laid hands on Timothy, they prayed for him, they acknowledged his gifts, and they spoke words of affirmation about the future over him. And it really is, it's a picture of how we should be with the next generation. I was 16 years old, the very first time somebody looked at me and said, Trevor, God wants to do something great in your life. My dad didn't talk that way. My mom didn't talk that way. My grandparents didn't talk that way. But on a Wednesday night, outside of church, at 16 years old, I could take you to the very place that I was standing in the front lawn of the church when my pastor looked at me and said, Trevor, I don't know you very well, but I just believe with all of my heart, God wants to do something great with your life. Those words echo in my mind to this day. I remember the old men and the older women in the church that came up to me the first time that I spoke in front of a church and they just came up and they said, you're gonna be a great pastor one day. You know, God's gonna use you. And they, were just, they were just speaking over me. And I, those words, I've never forgotten. You wouldn't imagine how many people, I'm sure some of you would because you've never had anybody speak to you that way. You can't imagine how many people coming behind us have never had anybody speak to them that way about their faith, about God wanting to use them, about God, about God wanting to do great things in them and through them and reminding them about it consistently. And that's how we need to be with the next generation. It, it's part of our calling. It's part of, it's part of our responsibility. And so that's what he did. And, it says, and so they traveled from town to town and he took him with him and, and, and Timothy got a front row seat. Uh, it took him to Philippi and he got to see Paul and Silas arrested for preaching the gospel, beaten for preaching the gospel, thrown in jail. But he also got to see how they refused to feel sorry for themselves and lick their wounds how they refused to quit. And at midnight, they actually decided to sing and then God sent an earthquake and he opened up you know, the door to the jail cell. But before they ran away, no, that's what you do when you're at the front of the line. You just run away, you just go take care of yourself. But before they went away, they led the jailer to faith in Christ. He, he got to see that. He got to see faith in action. He, he got to see it in all of its difficulty and all of its, you know, all of its trying moments. And then he got to see Silas and Paul limp to, to Thessalonica, walk into Thessalonica bruised, refuse to quit after Philippi. And they walk into Thessalonica and they found one of the greatest, you know, churches in the New Testament because they refused to throw in their towel. And, and then, you know, then they go to Berea because they ran out of town in Thessalonica and, and Silas goes with them. And then Paul, uh, he went to Athens, but he told Tim and, uh, Timothy and Silas to stay behind in Berea. It's like, now he's like, okay, I'm giving you a little bit of a leash. I need you guys to stay here. Timothy, you stay with Silas. I'm going to Athens. You, you, guys, you guys figure it out on your own. And then later, they join Paul in Athens. And, and so this is kind of like a, a, a team they've got going on. And then Paul, Paul, once they got to Athens, Paul sent Timothy, this teenager, sent him back to Thessalonica, the same town that ran him out of town. Sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to check on the church, to teach the church and to bring back a report about the church. So he trusted him. He trusted him to do something important. He trusted him to do something that mattered. When he had very little, if any experience. This is a big deal. This is a lesson in leadership. This is a lesson in discipleship. And so then they join Paul after leaving Thessalonica in Corinth. They stay over a year there. While he's in Corinth, he writes, you know, the letter to the Romans, you know, kind of the magnum opus of, of Christianity. And at the end of that letter, this is what Paul puts in the letter. 
Timothy, my coworker, sends his greetings to you. Coworker. Somebody got promoted. Coworker. You see what Paul's doing here? This is, this is, this, this is so much better than I have the, the, the ability to communicate. He lifts Timothy up and puts him on the same level as he is. Paul's the guy. Paul, Paul's the voice. Paul's the face. But he lifts Timothy up and he says, my coworker says hi. He, he doesn't speak to him, you know, speak about him as a project. He speaks about him as a peer. And in doing so, he's given him credibility. He's given him a platform. He's given him opportunity. He's letting him develop. And, and Timothy will co-sponsor. I don't even know how that worked. He will co-sponsor many of Paul's letters. Second Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, First and Second Thessalonians. Every time Paul gives Timothy some credit in that letter. Well, how much did Timothy you know, contribute to the letter? I don't know. But Paul put his letter in there, put his name in there because he's elevating his status. He's elevating his status, he's elevating his visibility. He's elevating the volume of Timothy's voice in the minds and in the hearts of the church. And then on the third missionary journey, uh, they spend you know, like two years in, in Ephesus and there's all kinds of fun stories there you can read about in Acts 19. And, and then you know, after Ephesus, uh, Paul sends Timothy ahead into Macedonia. So he sends him on and then Paul meets him. And then once Paul gets to Macedonia, he pins the letter uh, to the Corinthians. And guess who carried the letter back to the Corinthians? It was Timothy. So he actually trusted him with one of his letters that made it into the book. This is a big deal. So he's trusted him. He's given him an opportunity. And every time we give somebody an opportunity, we are giving someone an opportunity to fail. There's always gonna be an opportunity to fail. There's always gonna be an opportunity not to get it right. There's always gonna be an opportunity to fall. But that is part of learning. That's part of discipleship. That's part of growing strong. There's no such thing as not falling. There's no such thing as not failing. And so Paul knows this, but he's able to release Timothy to go do this. And so this is what he put in the letter. He says, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I've sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way in Christ Jesus. So, Paul would say, I know you'd rather see me, but you're gonna see him. I know you'd rather hear from me, but you're gonna hear from him. And that's okay. Because there has to be a voice of the next generation that's heard. There's gotta be a presence of the next generation that's seen in order for the future of faith to be developed. So Paul goes to Jerusalem, he gets arrested. He ends up in Rome and guess who meets him in Rome? Timothy. Timothy's right there. Paul allows Timothy, he's given him opportunity. He's given him responsibility. Paul saw Timothy as a son and a brother. A son to lean into, a brother to lean onto. A son to lead, but a brother to unleash. A brother with present value. A son with future potential. A son to develop, but at the same time, a brother to deploy. That's how Paul saw this teenager named Timothy. Maybe in his early 20s at this point, Paul saw potential when he saw the next generation. And we have to do the same. We have to be willing to give the next generation of faith a voice. We have to be willing to allow the next generation of faith a platform. We have to be willing to allow the next generation of faith to be both seen and heard. If we are not willing to do so, we just might forfeit the next generation. AD 62, Paul's released from prison in Rome. He does a whole lot of traveling. Uh, he travels back to Ephesus. And when he goes back to Ephesus, he makes Timothy the pastor there. Timothy becomes the pastor at Ephesus. Paul goes on to Macedonia, writes the letter to Timothy, which is 1 Timothy. And he writes 1 Timothy as a letter that encourages the new pastor of Ephesus. He says, I want you to have a pure heart because it's hard to have a pure heart. I want you to fight the fight of faith well because it's hard to fight the fight of faith well. I want you to cling to faith because it's easy to let go of it. And I want you to nurture your conscience because it's easy to get desensitized. 
And he encourages him. He said, don't let anybody look down on your youth there, Timothy. Just because you're young, don't let those old people intimidate you. Don't let the older people in the church sit there like you have nothing to say and nothing to teach them. Don't you dare let anybody think less of you because of your age. To which he was also saying to the older people, don't you dare be so smug. Don't you dare be so self-righteous and self-centered and front of the line thinking that you don't think anybody who's younger than you, who's notably younger than you, speak into your life and lead you. He's saying to Timothy, don't let them do it. And at the same time, he's saying to them, shame on you. Thank you, sister. He says, give attention to the, to the reading of the scriptures, the encouragement of the believers and the teaching of the truth. Guard what's been entrusted to you. 67 AD, Paul's arrested the second time. Nero's the emperor, the end is near. At this point, he's known Timothy for about 20 years. So you can just do the math. Paul, you know, Timothy's now you know, in his mid-30s, 35, 36. Paul's in Rome, Timothy's pastoring in Ephesus. And so he writes, knowing that his death is near, Paul picks up his pen and he writes another letter to Timothy. We call it the book of 2 Timothy. And as you open up that book, it's so emotional to read, knowing where Paul is and knowing his history with his son and his coworker. He says, Timothy, he says, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you. I, I remember your tears when we had to say goodbye. I cannot wait for the joy of seeing you again. But until I do, fan the flame. Don't let the passion go out. Burn bright. Don't, don't live your life with a spirit of fear because you've been given a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Guard that deposit that's been put in you. Be strong like a soldier, run well like an athlete, farm like a farmer who's got his eyes on the harvest. Don't give up, don't give in. He says these words to Timothy, he says, you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths. Now teach these truths, Timothy, to other trustworthy people who will pass them on to others. In other words, Timothy, do for another generation what a generation did for you. Live your life thinking about not only your present generation of faith, but the future generation of faith. Leverage today's influence for tomorrow's good. You're gonna leave a mark, leave a good one. He says, flee the evil desires of youth. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't sabotage your future, Timothy. Don't undermine your future with self-serving interpretations of scripture or mindless speculations about mysteries about God. Don't let your freedoms enslave you. He gives you all of this all of this advice, which had to be born out of Paul's own experiences, all of this advice that he just gives, he gives it to Timothy straight up in his face. Timothy, it's not gonna be easy. It's gonna be difficult. There's landmines, <laughs> there's enemies. This is gonna be hard. But like a good mentor, like a good father, you, you don't hide these realities from your development of your son or daughter, you, you tell them life's gonna be tough, life's gonna be hard, it's, it's hard for us, it's gonna be hard for them. So go after what's good and find good people to do it with because it'll make it easier. You get your good people around you, you get friends who love you, you get people who've got your back and you go and you chase after what's good with them because that's how you're gonna get there. He says, you, however, you know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, persecution, suffering, what kind of things happen to me? How do you know? He let him in. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. Don't turn your back on the investment of a generation into your life. And all of this, I think, Reminds us that the present generation's legacy, this present generation's legacy should be that we taught the next generation what to believe and how to behave and why both matter. What to believe and how to behave and why both matter. To show them the non-negotiables of, of the Christian faith, the most important things to believe, what to hold with closed hands, what to have with open hands. To, sh to show the next generation how to show grace, extend love, how to forgive, 
how to have serious friendships, how to have meaningful, mature expressions of faith in our life, how to read the scriptures, how to teach the scriptures, to show the next generation that the way of Jesus may not be easier, but it's certainly gonna be better. It's the better way to show people how to suffer, show the next generation how to get sick and suffer, clinging to the promises of God, clinging to our faith, to show the generation coming behind us how to die in faith, how not to forfeit our joy or our hope. That's what we're called to do. But we live in a day when a younger generation wants brothers and sisters but no fathers or mothers and an older generation who wants brothers and sisters, but no sons or daughters. We have multiple generations who want to put themselves at the front of the line. And what do they want? They want friends. They want brothers and sisters, but they don't want mentors. They don't want coaches. And another generation standing at the front of their line who wants brothers and sisters, but they don't want the responsibility of a spiritual son or a spiritual daughter. And we can't do the great thing unless we surround ourselves with both, brothers and sisters, someone to look up to who's a father or a mother, a mentor in the faith, and someone to look behind to that we can begin to be a mentor to, a coach to, a father or a mother in the faith to. I wouldn't be where I am today without people who took time to be a part of my life and to invite me to be a part of their life from Sunday school teachers to to pastors, to to parents of some of my friends, to to people in in the church that I grew up in, to, to family members. The rest of the story for Timothy is that Paul dies. He says, I'm, I'm ready, my departure's at hand. But come to me, come quickly, get Mark, bring him, get my books, bring my coat. I want you to be here. Paul wanted at the end of his life, the people that he considered sons and brothers. He wanted the people there that he had invested in, that he wanted the future of faith there. So what happened? Paul died and Timothy followed Paul's example to prison and eventually unto death. He was killed for his faith around 80 years old, nearly 30 years after Paul wrote 2 Timothy. And Timothy passed it on to the next generation, who passed it on to the next generation, who passed it on until it got to you and to me. And now we are called to do the same. What's the next generation worth? What's the faith of the next generation worth? Everything. As moms and dads, as grandparents, what's the faith of the next generation worth? Everything. So what they finished the top of their class? So what they're the best? So what, they've got all the popularity and all the looks and they're just so cool and cute. So what? If the handoff gets dropped. And so what as a church? So all the things that we can do and have done and the resume and the accomplishments and the campuses and the building, so what? If somewhere along the way we, we drop the handoff, what's the faith of the next generation worth? Everything. Everything. Heavenly Father, remind us of this as families and remind us of this as the local church. Remind us that when we see the children in our families, the children in our church, the teenagers in our families, the teenagers in our church, we are looking at the future of faith. We are looking at the next generation. 
And we have a personal responsibility to pass it on. And I pray we get this right. We have to get this right. And I pray we will in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.